I am Marie Wilkinson, Chairman of Aurora Human Relations Commission. Born in the French Quarter of New Orleans, Louisiana, on May 6, 1909, Marie LeBeau entered a world full of hate against all those who were of a different skin color. Marie fought for her own rights, and she never let anything or anyone stop her from achieving equality for all. Her humanitarian love drove her lifelong struggle to bring better lives to the underprivileged in the face of economic and racial injustice. Marie LeBeau arrived to the city of Aurora in 1927 when she married Charles Wilkinson. In the late 1930s, illness struck Marie. She began to suffer from cancer, a bleeding ulcer, and an unhealthy heart. Before the end came for Marie, she made a pact with God. She promised to help people in need if she was granted the opportunity to raise her daughter. Her mission was just about to begin. In 1949, Marie Wilkinson stepped into Hearts Drive-In, a sandwich restaurant located on Lake Street in Aurora. The restaurant refused to serve Marie because of the color of her skin. Long before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, Marie refused to be treated unjustly. She sued the restaurant and the case went on to the Illinois Appellate Court, where records show that the judge ruled against Marie on the basis that the restaurant was not liable for its employees' actions. Marie's daughter claims that the case advanced to the Illinois Supreme Court, where Marie won. In order to have the minorities heard, Marie Wilkinson began the Aurora Human Relations Commission in 1964. She became the first chairperson of the committee whose purpose was to solve discrimination problems. The committee fought for their rights when people were denied a job or refused service based on their race. Marie Wilkinson was also chairperson of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Illinois. She helped collect a total of $1,600 to pay the bail of the participants in the march from Selma to Montgomery that had taken place on March 21, 1965. Because of her role with the SCLC, Marie Wilkinson and the conference were being accused of having communist affiliation, as printed in the Aurora Beacon News in the issue of April 4, 1965. After the summer march, Marie Wilkinson received a personal phone call and letter from Martin Luther King Jr. He thanked Marie for the funds she had collected. Marie Wilkinson was getting much attention for all the fights she won to gain equality for all. She even received death threats from people in the community, but this didn't stop. In 1971, Marie established the Marie Wilkinson Child Development Center, and it became the first integrated daycare center for young children in the city of Aurora. And in 1975, helped establish the Quad County Urban League chapter in Aurora. Marie saw the need to establish organizations that would help underprivileged families. They were underfed, and Marie's response was to establish the Aurora Feed the Hungry program. This program provided food for the community at reduced prices. Marie was also involved in establishing the Hassett House. In recognition of her outstanding charity work, Marie was honored by receiving the Lumen Christi Award given to her by the Catholic Church Extension Society in 2001. The Lumen Christi Award recognizes all those individuals who spread the word of God among the poor, the isolated, and the prosecuted, expecting nothing in return. The previous recipients of this award include one of Marie's role models, Mother Teresa. Marie is the second woman to receive this award, but she is the first civilian in the world to be awarded the Lumen Christi Award. Marie Wilkinson did so much for the city of Aurora. She fought with the city to give equal opportunity for all through the fair housing. She helped the underprivileged community by creating facilities to fit their needs. Marie never backed down from a challenge risking everything, including her life. Through her belief as a humanitarian and in love for all, she taught us that history can be altered for the better by a single person and their good actions, changing lives from conflict to conflict. The history of the unknown story of the woman who became Aurora's miracle, Marie Wilkinson. As she herself has said, I want you to know that I love you all. If I didn't, I would have not done so much for you. You cannot do anything against it because I love you all. Wow. Aurora's own. 
Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. It was, it was very fitting that we began tonight with Aurora's matriarch, Miss Marie Wilkins. If, if you were fortunate enough to have met her, and, and I was, you know how special she was and, and continues to be for our community. She laid the foundation for so many of us African-Americans that we stand upon today. Tonight, we will look at those who laid the foundation for her arrival, some of them coming to Aurora 80 years before she arrived. Welcome to our third of four community conversations in honor of Black History Month in Aurora. We held two dynamic conversations last week with some of our trailblazers. For the first one, uh, and a young leader of Generation Z who inspired our youth for the second. On Saturday, we'll conclude the series with a conversation with some of our uh, Black police officers here in Aurora. Tonight, we inspire, we, I, tonight was inspired by an article I read earlier this month published by the Aurora Historical Society. In that article, Executive Director John Jarrows eloquently shared the history of some of the first Black families in Aurora. Uh, it was so fascinating, and I knew the rest of our community need to be made aware of the historical information and figures that, that were pioneers in our city. You know, when I saw some of the photos of the early Black community, many of them freed slaves, some living in housing barracks and groups, I was immediately reminded of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. One of the lines that James Weldon Johnson sang in the song is, Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn has died. I felt those words while viewing the photos and thinking in the literal, literally, the literal rough roads they had to travel to get here and the figurative stony roads they had to continue for more than a century until the civil rights movement occurred. So tonight, I asked two scholars to join me to help share more. They are historians who have Aurora's, who, who know Aurora's history well. Thank you, John Jaros and Dennis Buck for joining us. Um, please tell our guests a little bit more about yourself. John, why don't you start first, brother? Introduce yourself to our, to our watching uh, audience. Sure. Um, I'm John Jaros uh, from the Aurora Historical Society. I've been uh, with the Historical Society uh, for more than 35 years now. And uh, I, uh, I've looked at a lot of different areas of uh, our local history and uh, we'll be along with uh, with Dennis too. Dennis Buck was our uh, chief curator for 14 years, worked with me and uh, he's done a lot of research on, on the African Americans. He kind of spurred the whole um, movement for us to, to really get the historical society looking into this and then I kind of continued it a little bit and uh, I I love Aurora history. We've got uh, uh, such great history and architecture, and uh, it, it's always uh, always a pleasure for me to to look into the past. Absolutely, we enjoy looking in the past with you, uh, John Jaros. Uh, now, Dennis Buck, can you introduce yourself to our to our audience? Uh, sure. Um, as John says, uh, for uh, many years I was the curator at the Aurora Historical Society. John hired me. Um, and uh, I am uh, currently actually working for the Forest Preserve District of DuPage in a, in a similar capacity. I uh, just recently became the uh, coordinator of their uh, heritage interpretation and collections. Um, at the time that I was there in Aurora, um, the, the foundation of this project, uh, John and the rest of the Historical Society uh, leadership were very generous. Uh, in allowing me to um, finish my master's work by doing this research. This actually started off as my master's thesis. Wow. Um, and once uh, completed, uh, I got some, some encouragement um, actually from some folks uh, in the Aurora community, in the black community, um, who uh, I had shared my research with and they uh, were very, generous uh, with their encouragement and, and suggested that the historical study should publish this. And so that's, uh, that was the, the beginning of that, of, of that project. Wow, that's great. And we'll talk a little bit more about that project, you know, as we get on in the, um, in the show here. But let's, um, 
you know, let's start off with um, discussion on early families. Uh, John, I understand that you have a little bit of a PowerPoint that you want to show us about some of the first families, first black families that settled here in the city of Aurora. I do, and let me see if the technology works and I can show it to you. Absolutely, look forward to seeing it. Can you see this? I sure can. All right, <laughs> it works. All right, well, we're gonna, we're gonna start uh, by looking at Aurora before the Civil War. Uh, before the Civil War, we had a population of just about 6,000 people. Um, it was a, a mill town. Uh, we had a railroad by then. And uh, Aurora... let me just let me just ask a question. Now, back then, you know, because I, I see on this photo here, it says 18. Is that 59? 59 and 60. Yes. Okay. So uh, back then, 6,000, that was a lot of people in a town, wasn't it? Uh, well, Aurora was always the pretty much the largest uh, town in the Fox Valley. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, that was pretty good. Now you can see this is a, a view of Stope Island. Uh, you know, if you think of Stope Island today, uh, it's all built up, but this is looking um, east to west across the island. You see two bridges on for either channel and uh, uh, this kind of uh, dead area in uh, to the right, uh, to the right of the road is uh, now where the uh, Pierce Center is today. And uh, but back, back then it was not developed in in any way, you can see. Um, I think Dennis wanted to uh, mention something about something. Yeah, if, well. if you put your cursor over that little building on the very far right, um, one of the families, uh, one of the names that uh, is going to pop up here in just a few moments, this is, I believe, the home of, of a woman who was named Triggs. Uh, her last name was Triggs. Um, I, I could never verify that for sure, but uh, it was understood that she did live on the island around this time. Um, this little fenced area uh, to the side would would be it appears to be a, a to me to be a garden. Um, so this is a, a homestead of one of the first black settlers uh, in that early period. Very wow. um, Now at that time, there were you know before the Civil War, there were very few. Uh, black people in Aurora. Uh, we had uh, a fugitive slave law, uh, a national law that, uh, you know, if a slave escaped, people in the non-slave states were supposed to uh, return the slave to, uh, to its rightful owners. It was, um, we did have some underground railroad movement where slaves, uh, escaped slaves were coming through town. Uh, we don't know a lot about that, but we do know some of the churches were involved. And, um, but there weren't a lot of uh, black people living in Aurora that pretty much had to be a free black person to, to be living here before the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War is what changed everything. That's where we got the movement of blacks from the South uh, during and, and after the war. And here we've got uh, Aurora's own, the Fox Valley Regiment, uh, the 36th uh, Illinois Volunteer Infantry. Uh, now the Civil War, as everyone knows, was a, a, quite a conflict. That we had um, at least 620,000 deaths between the Union and the uh, Confederate forces. Some people say as many as 750,000 deaths, and it was a terrible, terrible conflict. And it, it uh, pretty much ruined a lot of the South as well, uh, because that's where most of the uh, fighting was taking place. But I want to show you. Uh, what happened after the Civil War in Aurora, there was a great boom that occurred. And so uh, you look at the 1870 population was 11,000 versus the 6,000 10 years earlier. Uh, so almost doubled the population. Uh, there was a great development of uh, building. And this is Stolp Island looking uh, west to east. And this would be Downer and Stulp. So we've got Charlie's Creamery over that, here. Right, that is there now. That's there now. So that building still exists with, exactly. with brand new things going on apartments upstairs and Charlie's Ice Creamery in the bottom, right? right. The mm -hmm. old silver plate building. Yep. Uh, in this building, we've got the Pierce Art and History Center today. Right. And then over here, uh, this isn't the same building, but the building that replaced it 
is now Aurora City Hall. Correct. So you can kind of get your bearings. Absolutely. And now what happened um, also, be, besides the population growing a lot, um, black people started to come to Aurora. Some came actually during the Civil War. Uh, we'll talk about that. And a lot came after the war. Um, we're going to look here. This is one of the places that you spoke about, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, called the Barracks on, on Lake Street, where a lot of the early uh, Black population lived uh, as they came directly after the Civil War. And Illinois did its last uh, by any uh, census. Uh, Illinois used to do a census every five years uh, or every 10 years, but in between the national censuses. The last one we have is 1865. Aurora had a 9,000 population and 59 black people. Uh, and those are people that most likely came during the war or immediately afterwards because this census was enumerated in July, July 3rd of 1865. Then if you look at 1870, when we had the 11,000, um, people of color, we've got 141 that are classified as, as black and 37 classified as mulatto. And mulatto was a term back in the day for uh, mixed race persons. Now, when you started to get all these people together and, and it was looked like it was less than 200, it was enough that a community was starting and they decided uh, every community, good community especially uh, people of color, uh, churches are very important. And so by 1867, Aurora had two African or colored churches. The first was the African Methodist Episcopal, Episcopal uh, today St. John's AME. And that was organized in 1862. And um, down here, you can see in the officers of the church, one of the trustees is Mrs. Twiggs or Tw Triggs that Dennis just spoke about. Um, we've got a picture. This isn't their first church. They had several buildings, but this is their first brick church that they built. And it was built in 1884 by a black contractor, Cal Boger. We'll talk about him in a little bit. The other church- Wait, hold on. Was it, if you go back to that picture of the church, what street was that on? Is that- That was on um, what was Main then, but it's uh, East Galena and East. Uh, so right where Maine Baptist Church is? Oh, not, yes, around where, where Maine is mm -hmm. uh, today. Or um, They were in a, a similar area, but at this time, Maine wasn't quite there yet. Gotcha. Uh, in another location. So that building no longer exists? It, no. no. Um, the Colored Baptist Church, which later became the Third Baptist, later known as Main Street Baptist, and finally Maine Baptist today, uh, organized in June of 1867. And uh, when we look at the, the, uh, the trustees, we've got a guy by the name of Washington Palmer. He's one of the people we'll be looking at in just a few minutes as well. We do have a picture of one of their buildings. This is a uh, church building that they built in the 1890s. It's pictured about 1905. And this is uh, a portion of the congregation. I don't know. I don't assume that that's all the congregation, but at least some of them. And so this was by 1867, not this picture, but by 1867, you had two churches still going today. And by 1872, you had a Masonic Lodge, uh, the Keystone Lodge, number 15, organized in October of 1872. And um, no, I don't have anybody here that I'm going to talk about. But now, we know, we know, John, that the mayor is a member of the Keystone Lodge. Oh, well, well I am. I am. There we go. And a, a long standing history in Aurora. Now, we can look at census rolls and find a number of African American people in Aurora. We can also look at pictures and find the pictures are rarer and find some pictures. But it's hard to match up the pictures and the people. A lot of time, it's just like if you have, uh, if you're uh, of German ancestry or, or French ancestry or, or any other ancestry, you might have old family photos like this that are totally unidentified. I know I do. 
Um, they might have been family. They might have been family friends. And it's the same thing here. We've got unidentified African Americans, but we know they're Aurorans because they're photographed by Aurora photographers. And you can see that on, on the card. Don't know who the people are, but they were probably prominent members of the uh, African American community in Aurora. Now, there are some people that we do know a little bit about. And uh, I'm going to start with one of the guys that was in that early group that came to Aurora, uh, George Washington Palmer. He was referred to sometimes just as Washington Palmer. Uh, we say he was born circa 1840 because we don't really know. Uh, these people were born slaves. So there's really no birth record. Uh, this kind of stuff wasn't really kept. A lot of times they didn't really know how old they were. Um, so what we have is later records after they came to Aurora, you look at the census and it might say, uh, is that you know, 39 years old in a certain year of the census, census taken every 10 years. Some census is actually told the year of birth, but those varied every time. Even if I look at my own family history, and I look at that, the ages aren't always right from census to census. So it's, it's hard to determine, but we say about 1840, we know when he died, 1914. We know he was born a slave because uh, everything about him uh, says that his obituary says he was born a slave in Tennessee. We don't know where in Tennessee. Um, we know he came to Aurora about 1862 or 63 with a wife, Mary, and a young son. And uh, one of the ways that we can, uh, well, one of the ways that we can assume that he came here because slavery was still going on uh, is Tennessee was one of those states where a lot of battles were happening and the Union forces pretty much occupied the Eastern and middle section of Tennessee early on, as early as uh, mid-1862, they started. And when that happened, um, the slaves became somewhat free. Uh, they were considered by a lot of Union commanders contraband of war. And what that means is they were human contraband. Contraband is something that the enemy owns the property, which they were at that time, that you could take and use. And so what the Union commanders did in a lot of cases, and certainly in Tennessee, is they started uh, forming contraband camps. And slaves in Union-occupied areas would leave their, their homes and come here. They would get fed. Uh, sometimes they could get educated. They might work, uh, might help digging, uh, digging ditches and things like that. And then after about 1863, uh, some of the men were eligible to actually serve and, and fight. And so that's what I assume uh, happened with um, George Washington Palmer. Uh, we've got a map here of, this happened all over the South of contraband camps happening all over the South in Union occupied areas. And um, this is the state of Tennessee. And I wanna point out here, uh, Cairo. Uh, Cairo is on the Southern tip of Illinois. And if we look at the next slide, we have it right here. It's at the uh, conjunction of, of two big rivers. And uh, um, it looks like Cairo, but it's, they pronounce it Cairo. And this is uh, really a very Southern area, uh, uh, you know, right next to Kentucky, Missouri. Uh, but this was an area of a big uh, union encampment and a uh, big contraband camp. So a lot of the contraband, former slaves, ended up at Cairo. And what we've learned is that there, we've got the Illinois Central Railway line going into Cairo, goes all the way up north to Chicago and the Chicago area. We've learned that there was something called contraband trains that actually took some of these former slaves up to the north during uh, the Civil War era uh, to give them new homes. Uh, I don't know a lot about them. We know that uh, one went to Elgin with 125 contrabands, they called them, uh, in October of 1862. And uh, I, I assume that somehow um, George Washington 
Uh, Palmer is uh, one of those contraband people that came up uh, formerly a slave and got to Aurora well before the war ended. Uh, and one of the ways that we can prove that he was in Aurora is with this document. It's a Civil War draft registration from June of 1863. And if you look at the bottom lines, it says Town of Aurora. And if we go down to number 17 here, we've got Palmer Washington, 25 years of age, colored, laborer, married, born in the US. And so this is the proof that uh, George Washington Palmer was in Aurora uh, at least by 1863. Uh, if we look at a later census, 1880, um, we see gives his age about 40, born in Tennessee, uh, black, um, at this time working in a factory and uh, uh, tile factory, that might have been something like the Sulfusburg Brickworks or something like that. Uh, there were certain um, occupations that were open to African Americans. Um, masons was one of them. Brick mason, stone mason, bricklayer, plaster. Uh, and another one was a teamster, uh, someone who drives a team of horses, and drives wagons and deliveries. Uh, later on, um, Mr. Palmer was actually a teamster and he was uh, driving a wagon. Porter was another. Porter, yeah. Uh, Barber was another one. Barber was a big occupation for African Americans. When you uh, say driving a wagon, you mean a horse and buggy? Um, well, I mean like a delivery horse, wagon. Like horse and cart. Filled, horse and cart. You know, loaded, uh, loaded with goods or something like that. We, we still use the term teamster today. It usually refers to truckers. Got you, got you, got you. Okay, now this guy is probably one of the most interesting. Uh, Calvin Boger, uh, born a slave in Georgia, came to Aurora right after the Civil War, uh, got married in 1871. Um, now, we say circa 1844. Um, that's what he said, although some of the records, including census records, give the dates as 1846, 1847, 1850. Uh, we don't know for sure. But one of the things that Cal told us uh, well, not me, but he, he, he told his family. Uh, he came from a place called Hickory Flat, Georgia. We found Hickory Flat. It's in Cherokee County. We went to an 1860 slave schedule. This is from Ancestry.com. These are the uh, transcribed uh, things. Uh, the actual images are handwritten. And if I look uh, for this is the other thing that uh, most slaves took the surname of their masters. So uh, these are all people, white people by the name of Boger that owned slaves. And uh, this is the age of the slaves and the gender. I was looking for males that were born between 1844 and 1850 or around there. Um, and uh, there's no names. You're, when you look at these, you won't find a name. You won't find Calvin or Tom or, or uh, Susie or anything like that. You'll, you'll find this as much, as much as you can find. And we find that Martin Boger owned a 16-year-old male, black, which means this, this slave was born about 1844. And uh, Martha owned a 10-year-old. This slave was born about 1850. Now, further research in ancestry indicated that while these other Bogers lived near uh, Hickory Flat, they didn't live in Hickory Flat. Martin did live in Hickory Flat, Georgia. So if I look at the census schedule for Martin Boger, he was a small th farmer. He owned four slaves, not a big plantation. And one of those slaves uh, we just saw was a male that was 16 years old. Um, now, there used to be a standard in genealogy called a preponderance of evidence. I, I don't know if we've achieved a preponderance of evidence here yet, 
but I think it's a good assumption that that may be Calvin Boger. Don't know for sure, but uh, I, th I think there's a good, oh, uh, a good possibility. Now, we know that Cal, in the summer of 1864, escaped uh, to the Union lines. What was happening was uh, the Atlanta campaign. Sherman's Union forces were coming down from Tennessee and uh, winning battle after battle, making their way to Atlanta. We know that uh, Hickory Flat is about 40 miles north of Atlanta. And so these battles came within 20 miles of Hickory Flat and they had big guns going and you certainly could hear the guns going. Uh, so when you knew the Union troops were coming through, a lot of slaves did run away to the Union lines. One of the Illinois regiments that was uh, fighting was the 16th Illinois Cavalry. And they were at all these battles, battle after battle. Here's Kennesaw, Kennesaw Mountain. And uh, the captain of the 16th Illinois Cavalry was a guy by the name of John Q. Hattery. Um, and Cal hooked up with the 16th Illinois and uh, hooked up with Captain Hattery and served as some kind of an aide de camp or assistant or something like that. Uh, but when the war was over and uh, everybody was mustered out, uh, this regiment in August of 1865, Mr. Hattery came back to Aurora and so did Cal. And we know that um, the first city director or the first directory made after the Civil War was the Kane County Director of 1867. And we find these are from different pages. Uh, Calvin Boger works at A.J. Hattery and Company, boards the same place. A.J. Hattery and Company was a bakery owned by three brothers, Andrew, John, and William Hattery. So we know Cal was here in Aurora. This is our, our proof that he was here and as early as we can show it. Now, we know that Mr. Hattery in 1868 moved down to Springfield and married there and died there. However, Cal stayed in Aurora and here we have uh, an erroneous name. This is actually Calvin Boger from the 1880 census uh, shows that uh, born about 1845 in Georgia. And uh, by this time he had married um, Amy Boger her actual name, uh, her maiden name was Amy Hall. And she was interesting because she was a free black person. Um, her father was a very prominent Methodist, black Methodist minister, Abram uh, Hall. And he was prominent in Chicago. Then he moved his family out to Batavia. And I suppose there weren't a whole lot of black people all over the Fox Valley and somehow um, Calvin from Aurora met Amy from Batavia and they struck up some kind of a friendship and, and got married in 1871. This is some of, oh, and you notice now he has an occupation of stonemason, which again, another uh, occupation that blacks could, could uh, be, go into. And Cal was well known throughout town as a plasterer, a brick layer, and a construction contractor. Uh, so he was uh, quite respected and, and well known. This is some of his early family uh, later on in the 1880s, he had a couple of other children. Uh, one of them was uh, Henry Hank Boger. Henry was uh, an a, a interesting individual. He was a great athlete, played on the East Aurora football squad. I think he graduated in 1906 or something like that. Um, he went uh, through schooling. He went to college. Then he ended up teaching at the Tuskegee Institute. Uh, he was the head of the agriculture department there for a couple of years. And then he decided that the war uh, in 1917, the war started, he wanted to serve his country. Because he had college education, he was able to go through a special new officer training uh, school for black individuals, for colored people uh, in Des Moines, Iowa. And he came out commissioned as a second lieutenant. And... Uh, he was sent overseas uh, with black troops uh, in the summer of 1918 and saw uh, the last offensive uh, 
in the war, which was, uh, uh, he was in the trenches and under fire uh, many, many, many times on the front lines. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he ended up uh, dying on the lines uh, November 11th, 1918, which was Armistice Day, today Veterans Day, the last day of the war. And um, he's actually uh, buried over in, uh, in France at, in the American cemetery there. Now his brother, Thomas, his older brother, uh, did not go into service. Uh, he got his uh, medical license in 1915 and started practicing medicine in Aurora. And he was well known throughout the Aurora community. Um, go into a couple of other people. I know we're probably going to run a little long, so I'm going to try to uh, move a little faster. It was very um, interesting, brother. Very interesting. Okay. Here we've got uh, the Carter family, Bennett Carter, um, shown about 1897. We know he was born in Tennessee, came to Aurora in about 1879, married an Aurora girl, uh, Susie Catlett. And uh, we don't know much about him before he came to Aurora. I suppose there's more uh, research to be done, but I don't have, uh, could not pin him down before arriving in Aurora. Uh, we have his obituary here, uh, which calls him Deacon Carter, uh, a deacon in the Third Baptist Church, which is today Maine Baptist Church. And so he was, uh, again, highly respected and well-known in the community and certainly had a large family. I want to point to this individual right here. This is a, a young man by the name of Isaiah or Ike Carter. And if we go ahead, we find that Ike had a very long life. He continued um, in the plastering business uh, as, as his father had been in as well and ended up living to 106 years old. And so- uh, Passing in what year? Uh, in 1991, he died uh, at 106. Um, wow. Dennis, did you have anything that you wanted to add there? I, well, I did. So I, I was actually gonna just very quickly stick in a couple of things. Um, when I was doing the research uh, for the project that I spoke of earlier that is was sort of the beginning of this uh, additional research that John has added layered on. Um, the, the letters uh, that Henry Boger wrote home from France um, are, uh, we have copies of those letters at the Historical Society. So um, Cal, his family, uh, and particularly Henry uh, are, are prominent figures in, in the book that I wrote simply because I had those resources to, to use. Um, just a, a fascinating young man. Um, Ike, or Isaiah Carter, um, what we had from him was actually uh, the historian's version of Pure Gold, which was an oral interview. Um, one of my predecessors at the Historical Society um, got a chance to interview Mr. Carter before he passed away. And he talked about his life and his work um, and to actually hear his voice telling his story um, was just very inspiring. And, and it was, uh, again, a big part of that research. Uh, that was, uh, we were really fortunate. That was our, our curator at the time, Mike Sarna. Uh, I think it was about 1988, about this year that, that he, he did that. Um, uh, now, let me just jump in for a second. You know, my sure. my great grandfather, Richard Baxter Irvin, is also from Tennessee and came up, was born a slave and came up here, but he didn't settle in Aurora. He settled in Oswego. And uh -huh. then all of his 12 children moved, you know, to Aurora. Now, back then, of course, Aurora probably seemed like it was, you know, uh, many miles away, you know, from us from Oswego. But he was also a brick mason. So, I, man, I wonder if he and Cal, you know, even, even knew each other. And from what I understand from the historians in Oswego, some of his brickwork is still part of Oswego's foundation. Well, that's that's great, a great story. You know, I, I think that the Black community was small enough all throughout the Fox Valley yeah. that most of them probably were acquainted with each other. And certainly if they were in, in any type of business. 
So I, I, I think your, your uh, was it great grandfather or great, great grandfather. No, one great, one great. Okay. Pro probably knew uh, great, Cal, Cal voter. I would, I would suggest socially as well. You, you mentioned that you were in the, in the Keystone Lodge, the Keystone Lodge used to do socials uh, in Aurora, but also in Batavia and also, so uh, there were, I, I, I think there was a lot of that kind of, um, the, the individual communities uh, within the different towns were so small that it was, I, I think, um, the larger community expanded out to those other towns. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, I mean, if you think about it, Batavia is probably just as far away from Aurora as Oswego, but, you know, just to the, to the south versus to the north. So if they, it's very possible they all came together. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That, I, have, I have one more uh uh, guy that I'm I'm trying to highlight Wait. here, um, okay. Alfred Lucas. Uh, he's the, of course he's the the gentleman seated on the right. These gentlemen are both in uniforms. The guy on the left is uh, Peter Pug Jungles, and uh, he was a fireman. Uh, Alfred Lewis uh, Lucas uh, is in actually a police uniform, um, and we'll talk about him in a second. He was born in Kentucky. Now, I can only find him coming to Aurora about the mid 1880s, although his obituary says that he was here about 10 years earlier than that. I just can't find any documentation of it. But we know that in 1886, he did marry, um, this is from a different Carter, uh, African-American family, uh, Emma Carter. And uh, what Mr. Lewis was, was the police patrol driver and here's his, the entry in the city directory from 1902 to 03. Uh, Lucas Alfred C., his wife, Mary E., parentheses, colored, occupation patrol driver, home, 26 Rose Street. Now, um, from about 1890 to the 1920s, the Aurora city directories all indicated colored people with either COL or COL apostrophe D in parentheses or C in parentheses. Now, um, that, that may seem kind of racist, but for us today as historians, it's actually a plus because I can look through the city directories and see everybody that's got a C or a color, I know where the, who the black people were in Aurora. Um, so that's you know, one of those things. Now, uh, what you did as the patrol driver is you drove the patrol wagon. Now, this is not the Aurora patrol wagon. We don't have a picture of that, but um, the, the Aurora wagon was probably uh, more dark and black. It was called, uh, the nickname for the Aurora patrol uh, wagon was the Black Mariah. And uh, that patrol wagon was used by the police to uh, pick up and transport sick, transport sick people to their homes or to the hospital, to pick up dead bodies and transport them to the morgue or to the funeral home, and to pick up arrestees. Uh, the cop out on the beat was just walking the beat. If he's arresting somebody, he's got to get him back to the jail. Uh, they had call boxes and they could do these little rings and, and call for the patrol wagon and the patrol wagon would come out and pick him up. And who was at the, the head of the patrol wagon was Alfred Lucas. And again, that was another, as we talked about, another occupation that was open to African-Americans. If you could drive a wagon, you could uh, drive horses. And so that's what he was doing. And uh, in 1903, for example, I looked this up through old city reports, the patrol wagon made 800 runs during the, the year. What year? 1903. 1903. So 800 runs, uh, 800 times in a, a single calendar year, uh, Alfred Lucas took the wagon out and put it to use uh, for the police. Now, uh, Alfred uh, died prematurely in 1906. Uh, he was not even 50 years old, he was 48. And uh, he, uh, he got quite a nice write-up in, in the Beacon News. Um, 
that uh, he was well known throughout the whole community because of his work with the patrol wagon. And uh, he was also a member of the Colored Knights of Pythias and uh, the Colored Masonry, which I guess is the, the Keystone Lodge. Mm -hmm. so, um, and here, uh, always one of my favorite pictures, it's the uh, New York Street School, which was a little small schoolhouse at uh, New York and, and Smith um, in the 1890s. And you can see uh, black children and white children all together. Um, now, I have a feeling that a lot of these children are probably Ben Carter's children because he had a, quite a brood, but um, some, other, some others as well. And I think the whole, uh, well, some of the people we've looked at, uh, it's the American story. They've lived the American dream. They, they, they came from slavery. Uh, they moved someplace else for a new, new life, like immigrants did from other countries, came to America. Uh, the slaves from the South came up North for a new li life, uh, they uh, learned trades, they uh, raised families, and then their children were better than them. They, their children got to achieve a higher level than they did. That's what everybody wants for their children. And that's certainly what all immigrants wanted. And that's what all former slaves wanted. Most of the former slaves were illiterate, but their children got to go to school, to public school, and learn to read and write. And I, th I think that's an amazing thing. Absolutely amazing, brother. And uh, well, that's that's all I've got. But um, for your portion, John, it's been it was very very enlightening. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know really how to feel about it, man. At one point, you know, you, you feel I feel, you know, just um, just that that there was such a history there, and that those folks way back then worked so hard to get us where we're at today. You know, so, you know, I, I feel a sense of pride, but to hear where they came from, you know, slavery and in the, and see the, the circumstance they lived in, in barracks, you know, you know, it's, there's, you know, a feeling of, of, you know, anger, but I guess it was just a sign of the, it was just the time, sign of the times. Huh? Well, and, and I think Dennis will, will tell you that even after they came up here, it was really no picnic, was it, Dennis? Well, so the, the title of my book actually came from a quote that I, I uh, squirreled out of the, uh, 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 the Beacon, a very old copy of the Beacon. Um, a lot of my research was done through microfilm, uh, scrolling through census records, trying to find individuals, um, and scrolling through the Beacon, old copies of the Beacon. And I ran across an, uh, a series of articles uh, written by an, an author who claimed to be Black, um, and of course, from this distance, you, you never know, is somebody writing under a pseudonym? Um, are they black? Are they not? Um, but that was the, that was the claim. And the, this person uh, now, used would, the term- Why would somebody claim to be black? It, 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 well, it, so Aurora was, uh, Aurora was a, uh, a very strong uh, abolitionist center in the Fox Valley. Actually, most of the Fox Valley was very strongly abolitionist. Um, but Aurora had a, 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 a very strong um, abolitionist movement in town. There were actually, uh, John mentioned the Underground Railroad. Um, most towns would have a stop on the Underground Railroad, if that. Um, Aurora has at least three known stops, um, and there were probably more. Um, the one of the, the there are two issues with researching the underground railroad one of which is that at the time it's meant to be a secret uh, so you're not advertising that you're on the underground railroad and then after the fact um, uh, folks who were very proud of that history uh, would suddenly come out and claim that they had been a part of the underground railroad were they actually mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to tell, um, but uh, to your question, um, some of the um, some of the efforts to um, talk about the work of the Underground Railroad to um, endorse those kinds of things. Um, if you were a white person, uh, you might adopt the 
persona of a black person um, to make your case. Gotcha. Um, so, but this person referred to their their um, journey from slavery to glory, and uh, their um, their uh, journey as they marked it was that they were born property, and uh, then were contraband, uh, which was still sort of property, but property that had been liberated um, from its previous condition. Um, and then they had become freedmen. And but now he had not only the right to vote, but the right to run for office um, and, and to shape his own destiny, which he considered glory. Um, I used it as the title with, because in, in retrospect, looking back at this author who was writing so many years ago, he may have jumped the gun a little bit. We weren't at glory yet, um, pretty clearly. Well, I mean, if you, if you had to compare slavery and then the freedom and the opportunity, it may be glory to those folks back in, back in those days. You know, I mean, if you precisely put in precisely. perspective, you know. Precisely. And that's exactly my point is that um, one of the reasons I'm so excited about tonight um, is that my whole purpose in in writing this um, and publishing this originally, um, I I had no illusions or intentions of writing the definitive history of early Black Aurora. Um, my purpose was to start a conversation. Um, it was a conversation that the Historical Society had not been participating in. And um, what I had actually set out to do originally, one of my first goals and one of the few that I was unable to achieve in my time at Aurora, I wanted to do a kind of an all-encompassing exhibit of Aurora as a, as a whole. What does it mean to be an Auroran? And what I discovered was that there were very significant chapters of that story for which I couldn't answer the question. I, I didn't have the information. And so I, I tabled that project and instead set about answering what I considered to be the biggest gap in that story, which was the arrival of African-Americans into, into Aurora. Um, it was meant to start things off. And the fact that John has continued the research, um, a lot of those things that he showed you they're not in my book. I didn't have some of those pictures. They weren't at the Historical Society when I was working. Um, they've come in since. The historical record continues to grow. Um, John uh, put out his uh, blog, which you, Mr. Mayor, uh, got excited about and some other folks did as well. The, the conversation continues. Um, and, and that's really what history is. History is never done. Um, and, and so um, that's what, that was, I, I guess, my main, what I wanted to, to add as my main point for the evening. What do you say, John? What were you saying? John, you said you're, you're. Oh, did he freeze? Yeah, I, I think we lost, we lost John for a few minutes. Maybe he'll, um, Clayton, get in contact with him and come back on. Can you talk, talk a little bit more about, if you don't mind, Dennis, talk, a, John, you there? I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. You're back. Okay. You, I don't know what, was that me or what happened there? You know, I, you, I you froze know. there for a second, but that's okay. You're back. So oh, um, I, I I lost you, and yeah, sorry about that. Talk, you were making a statement before you before you froze. You're you're going to say something based on something Dennis was saying. Oh, I I actually oh I froze, and I on my screen Dennis froze. So, <laughs> um, hello. Yeah, we're good. here. Oh, I froze again. I guess. No. No, you're good. Um, well, maybe he can't see us. So let me just ask yeah, you. Dennis. I, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. We'll get it. We'll, we'll get continue. it. Continue. So Dennis, uh, let me, let me ask you, brother, you know, talk a little bit more about this book and some, you know, you said you, you, you initially didn't plan to write a book. You just want to start a conversation. And the more you delved into it and saw the history, the more you recognize you had to string all this together and memorialize it. You know, uh, how did you start? You know, how was their beginning, middle and end? How, how did you work that out? Okay, so um, the, the, the important letters in history, to me, are the last ones, story. Um, history is stories. Uh, some of the stories are great, big, grand national stories. 
Um, but most of those stories, the interesting ones, uh, where they get interesting is where those great big national stories intersect with ours. Um, it's, it's a very, very powerful thing to know your story. And um, what a local historical society's mission is, is to collect those stories, mm -hmm. to try to help people preserve those stories. Um, and uh, when I started that research and discovered that there were such gaps um, in, in the, the uh, overall record of Aurora, um, that was, it, it was, it was pretty clear what my first step needed to be, which was just simple research. Um, the, as the research began to grow and the historical society, as I mentioned in the board were very generous with my time and, and allowed me to take literally weeks at a time doing nothing but scrolling through microfilm. Um, I wanted to, uh, I began to get the sense that I wanted to do more with the research uh, than just compile it. Um, I wanted to make sure that it got out. Um, with a museum, a lot of ways, a lot of times that's done through exhibits. Um, and so we had thought about doing some, some exhibits. Um, there are other methods as well, um, but uh, in the process, there was so much information that, as I mentioned, it became my master's thesis. So it was already strung together in a bit of a narrative form. It was pretty academic, um, but it was there. Um, and then, uh, and then, as I say, I, I shared that information with with some some friends uh, there in Aurora, um, who who encouraged me to not let it just stay as a copy at the historical society and a copy at the library and maybe a copy uh, in a couple of, of other places, um, but to make it as widely available as I could. Um, so let that- me, Let me jump and ask a question there. You said yeah. something, or you said, you know, history, you know, is actually ever evolving. You never finish history. You always just uncover new, you know, new parts of, of history. Mm -hmm. recognizing that when you're talking about a book, how did you begin it and how did you end it? If, you know, if in that case, history never really. Ends. So, so in the case of African-Americans coming to Aurora, there was a pretty clear beginning, which was where do I find the first names? Yeah. Um, the first names uh, actually started appearing. Uh, John mentioned they probably weren't residents. We, uh, I, I didn't find any evidence of residency prior to, the, the dates on my book, um, but in the 1830s, uh, not the 1830s, in the 1840s, um, there were references in the newspapers to uh, black folks living in Aurora. Um, they were clearly not settled in Aurora though. They were escaped, almost certainly escaped slaves. And so they would settle into Aurora for a little while, but Aurora wasn't big enough and there wasn't enough of a black community to hide them. <laughs> um, and Chicago was. And so uh, a lot of those folks would, would take uh, a train into Chicago um, if there was any sense. John mentioned the, the fugitive slave law. If, if people with Southern accents started showing up in Aurora, they would take the ne next train into Chicago and try to disappear. Um, so it's, it's not until uh, the first free blacks begin arriving in Aurora, which was in the 1850s. Um, I, I, I wasn't able to find a lot of information on them. I was able to piece together some plausible stories for them, um, similar to what John was talking about earlier. Um, but mostly, unfortunately for those folks, they were just names on pages. Uh, and but, you, as you, you but, as you, but as you point as you point out, it's it's easy to identify when the first African Americans, um, black free slaves, were here. What about how did you end it? So for me, the the stopping point in 1920 um, was a logical place to stop because John mentioned the rather 
rapid growth of the African American community. Um, but what happened after 1920, after World War I concluded and uh, the United States begins a big industrial boom, is what's often referred to in the history books as the Great Migration. And at that point, African, uh, American, the African American community in Aurora exploded. <laughs> And um, it would have become not a short little uh, volume. Uh, it would have become a life's work. <laughs> and, and the Historical Society had already been more than generous with my time. And so I felt I had to cut it off at 1920. Unfortunately, as many people uh, pointed out to me when the book came out, it was just when the story was getting interesting. Um, but... Uh, as I pointed out to them, it's also when a lot of their families, because that's why they were talking to me about it, a lot of their families came during that time. And I pointed out to them, and you know those stories. So I am now handing the project off to you. You need, <laughs> you folks need to compile your own stories that you know. And if you would like to share them with the Historical Society, if you would like to share them you know, with me at that time, um, I would love to have them. I would love to gather them. I would love to make available those stories too. Uh, but for my purposes, I had to stop then. Now, let me let me pick up with John. And, and I know we're pushing up on an hour, but you know, this is so interesting and, and we're just going to go about 10 minutes longer, if you don't mind. And I bet, you know, our listeners out there would be just as enthralled as I am and, and wouldn't mind that we go for a few minutes longer. John, let's pick up, let's pick up there. So we said, so Dennis said he stops his book in, in, uh, in pretty much the 1920s, but the Aurora Historical Society, you don't stop there. You keep going and logging the history of, of African-Americans here in the city. As a matter of fact, if, if, if anyone walked into the Pierce Center and walked to the section where we've got the, the portion with African-American history, it goes all the way up to, you know, uh, recent, uh, kind of recent times, isn't it? Well, I, you're part of it, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we, you know, history is always, uh, you know, everything we're doing today is, is tomorrow's history. And uh, as Dennis uh, pointed out, you know, some of the biggest influxes of African Americans actually happened after uh, his book, uh, you know, what's, what's called the Great Migration. Uh, scads and scads of, of uh, African Americans came up north uh, during and after World War I. Uh, during and after World War II, and up uh, up and through even the 1960s and 70s, and so um, it, it is continually happening. And we uh, we probably haven't been as good about uh, researching that and documenting it, but it is a project that we're very interested in uh, continuing uh, the whole uh, Great Migration theme, uh, because a lot of families in Aurora are part of those generations of African-Americans, the ones that came, uh, the ones we talked about today were really the, the, the early, early pioneers, but uh, you know, you've got people that, that were coming uh, like Marie Wilkinson, you know, came in the 1920s and uh, there's a lot of Aurora families where, where their forebearers came during that era as well. And now that's, that's a hundred years ago. So it's, it's uh, uh, we say it's it's more recent than what we talked about, but it's not that recent anymore. You know, my grandmother and her and her sisters all came from Kentucky, you know, uh, up to and settled in Aurora. And there's uh, about eight, you know, nine sisters and two brothers. And one of the sisters, uh, my grandmother's maiden name was Woodard, Mabel Woodard. One of her sisters, younger sisters, was Bonnie Woodard. Bonnie married a man by the name of Clinton Mays. Do you know that name? Oh. Oh, yes. Clinton Mays, the uh, first African-American uh, police officer, patrolman, yeah. uh, came on the, the Aurora Force in uh, 1964. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, a small world, but it's small how everything is connected. Uh, you know, and, that's that's one of the joys for me. That's one of the joys of history. The world actually gets a lot smaller. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when those stories start overlapping, it gets to be a lot of fun. You know, I, I would love to see if it, Clayton, you know, see if anyone had any any questions. I don't want to monopolize you guys' time. I could talk to you all night about the history <laughs> of, you know, African-Americans in the roar and how we got to where we're at today. Clayton, does anyone have any questions that they might want to ask one of these gentlemen? Clearly, we could talk all night, too. Question in, man. <laughs> so thank you for asking. Uh, first of all, people are saying great work. This is it's so encouraging. Um, the Lucas family has weighed in. Uh, oh, yeah. Donna, Donna Jean Lucas. 
uh, Donna Williams, our MLK award is named after uh, Donna Lucas Williams, uh, the family, you know, uh, the, the daughter and granddaughter of, of Mr. Lucas. So they're weighing in saying thank you for uh, documenting their family's history. Uh, mayor, we have a couple questions about history, but they ask, as the first black mayor, how do you feel looking at this history? What, is, what does that mean to you? You know, as I said, when I first look at some of these, these pictures, especially of the barracks where, you know, a lot of folks grouped in together and we hear the stories of, you know, the slaves coming up in the Underground Railroad, the first thing I feel is, you know, pain and, and sorrow and, and, and anger, but, but knowing that you know they, they they came here from an oppressive South, you know, born a slave and somebody's chattel, and at, at some point almost like lost property, you know, on this train ride up to somebody's lost property, but to eventually you know become free and have the ability to vote and even hold office or even have something as simple as a job where you get a paycheck and you take it home and take care of your family versus you know picking cotton or tobacco in some field and you know getting thrown scraps. So. When, when you say from slavery to glory, you know, put in perspective, although today that might not be glory for me, what they had to deal with sleeping in barracks, but for them, that was glory because they were no longer someone's property. So I feel a sense of pride in that. So along the story, it starts out with sorrow and pain, but it becomes pride because look at what, look at the foundation they built. Powerful. Speaking of our uh, foundations, People were saying you, you hear we we realize that there's so many things in a roar named after uh, uh, other uh, pioneers, particularly white pioneers. You think of Lake Street and McCarty Park and some of the things people were Farnsworth. No. Yeah. Where and they said uh, to the to the authors to John and to to Dennis the author to John in historical society. Uh, do you find any place in the history where other than like honorary street signs, that there's been this documentation or memorializing of black leaders um, uh, before Mrs. Wilkinson. Like that doctor you said that got his um, medical license years ago, it, what oh, happened to him and his family? And, and was anything ever named after him? Uh, I, I, I don't believe so. I know that, um, you know, we were in contact with, um, one of his daughters, uh, Jean Boger Jones, uh, uh, she's passed now, but I, uh, she grew up in Aurora, uh, lived her later life in Michigan. She was one of the people that helped us uh, with a lot of the research and getting these materials. But I, um, I think the recognition, uh, public recognition uh, with public monuments or, or names on things I don't think we've seen a lot of that for the African American community until recently. And as you say, then it's more honorary uh, uh, street signs and things like that. Um, you know, and and I think everybody knows that that Marie is really the big, the big one that that people know. And Mayor, the subsequent question of that is: in in upcoming years, could that be a a focus, a priority to look at? You know, memorializing some of the black leadership before Mrs. Wilkinson with official building streets and things of that sort? You know, I, I think absolutely that, you know, that should be, you know, something we strongly consider. And we're going to rely on, you know, folks like uh, John Jaros and, and Dennis to, you know, provide us this foundation, this background of the history that that helped build a road. The, the, the gentleman that that you said that was Mr. Carter that that drove the uh, that drove the, uh, the the horse and and and, and was a van horse and buggy. You don't call a horse and buggy horse with a horse and what? What did the are you talking about the 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 patrol driver who drove oh, the yeah, wagon oh, yeah. police? Yeah, the, the, the wagon, the horse and wagon. Yeah, that gentleman. You know, um, the uh, the mason that uh, you know prop, that some of his work may be part of you know Aurora's Aurora's infrastructure now. We don't even know. You know, I, I was actually going to point that out. They, they they may not have been given um, uh, the the official recognition, but their their own work actually very possibly still is standing. You know, we are, to answer that question, Clayton, we are a multicultural mix. And although we're talking about the African-American, you know, uh, participation in what Aurora is today, you know, um, because it's Black History Month and, and, and it should, you know, we should talk about this all the time, not just in a particular month assigned to a, a history of a culture. Um, we've got to rethink, you know, how everyone, the Latinos have played a part, the African-Americans have played a part, you know, and, you know, we can't just lump all, you know, white folks in a, a group together. we got the Romanians, we got the Germans. So we got to think about, 
who, who helped to make Aurora what is a day and how we can, you know, officially recognize them across the, across the board. But definitely for the black community, you know, and, and I and can you gentlemen tell me, you know, I know there are a couple areas I know where, where blacks lived, you know, in, in Aurora years ago, areas that were kind of carved out where at initially where they could only live, you know, and, and I know on the east side, there's a location that we're that we're calling Pattersonville and then on the west side, near west side, View Street area in the sixth ward. Can you tell how that happened and, and, and you know, how that those settlements occur? Because that's the east side and west. That's two different sides of town you know yeah i'll let john take most of this one i i i would uh uh one of the things that that the the research that i did with the census allowed me to do was to actually sort of do some mapping uh in the book of some patterns some settlement patterns um i had to make again make some uh, adjustments and assumptions uh educated guesses if you will um, but uh, the early settlement tended to be very much right along the river. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about a river that floods on a regular basis, that's going to be the less expensive property, uh, yeah. the easiest yeah. to get. Um, the, the Mrs. Triggs who lived on, on Stolp Island, her house with that beautiful little garden, it's very possible that three weeks after that picture that was taken, you couldn't even see her house <laughs> because it would have been about a half underwater. Um, because the island is built up now in a way that it wasn't then, um, and it flooded all the time. Um, so um, some of some of that early settlement pattern was it was concentrated very much along the river, uh, but over time, particularly on the east side of the river, it it did spread and move, um, and and then you begin getting these these kind of little neighborhoods. That's funny you should mention that. My great grandfather's house, Richard Baxter Irvin, who settled in Oswego, also had a home right along the river. Right along. Yeah, the river. That's, that's typically the less expensive property yeah. early John, on. John, what do you know about it, brother? I I don't know a lot. I, I think uh, Dennis is correct that as as uh, African Americans started moving out into the neighborhoods, there were a couple of places, uh, you know, the uh, in on the near east side of Aurora. Uh, if you if you start to go to the uh, what would be the northeast corner, uh, you know you start going uh, up towards uh, Ohio Street and and up up in that area there were there were some areas there's uh, in uh, the near west side as you mentioned Mr. Mayor uh, another little enclave area and I don't think we've done quite enough study on it I mean we know that those areas were there and that they had. A heavier concentration of African Americans. Um, I don't know why they ended up being uh, those particular ones. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. All right, and let's take one more question before we close. I know we're about 15 minutes over. Man, this is a very interesting conversation. Um, uh, both questions uh, together because they deal with the book. Mm -hmm. uh, Alderman Jenkins, who's also an author, uh, Dennis, he said hello. Uh, hi, hi there. <laughs> I see who wants to know if you have any interest in uh, updating your book from the 1920s beyond up to and including uh, Mayor Irvin. I was here, Legacy. And then the second question is where can the book be purchased now, your current book? Okay. Um, the, the second one's the easy one. Uh, the Historical Society still does have copies of my book. Um, I, I don't know what uh, the, um, the, the volume of that. Uh, uh, original run uh, is right now. Um, uh, if if I if I were to do any revision at this point of of the of the work, uh, it would be if, if the historical society actually finally ran out of them and was going to do a new printing. I was going to mention that I. I, I am I am somewhat committing myself right now. I would love to actually revise uh, some parts of what I wrote um, because anybody who's ever written anything, uh, even a, a school term paper, knows that uh, the minute you hand it in, you start finding things you wish you'd said different. Um, uh, there, uh, but I don't I don't have access to the. Um, those those resources the way that I did then uh, to be able to really expand that story. Um, I, I would very much go out and immediately buy the book by the person who does. 
Because uh, like, I would love to read that. Okay, I'd, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, uh, the, the idea of the continuation, uh, the rest of the story, um, the historical society uh, is very interested in that. Um, and in fact, we do have uh, one of our um, board members on our board of trustees is uh, Angie Thomas, who, who you know well. And uh, she is very interested in doing a project uh, with the historical society on the great migration, uh, the later migration to Aurora, and even uh, perhaps an oral video uh, history where we actually interview people. Uh, we haven't gotten that going yet, but we are interested in, in uh, pursuing that and uh, publishing something, whether it's uh, you know, uh, in book form or in video form or, or something like that. But the existing book, uh, From Slavery to Glory, um, is available. Uh, right now, our museum sites are closed, but it is available online. If you go to our website, uh, www.aurorahistory.net, aurorahistory.net, all one word. Uh, I think if you pull up the website, uh, because we have some uh, features for uh, Black History Month, uh, I think that the book is prominently featured uh, on the website and, and uh, there's uh, prompts to be able to uh, purchase it online and have it uh, sent to you. Thank you. And Mary, we have one final question yes, to sir. you before you uh, close us out. The question is, have you thought about uh, writing a book with your history and your connections uh, to your history making election in 2017? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I've thought about it. You know, when I become a little bit more famous and people will actually pay for it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll put Don't wait, sir. <laughs> Don't wait, sir. Don't wait. I got you. You know, I, yeah, I, I have to start putting some of the some pen to paper because I mean, Yes, yes. I, you know, I absolutely like to, you know, gentlemen, I, I want to thank you for coming here tonight and sharing with us, um, you know, uh, all this history, this rich history of the city of Aurora, you know, things that most of us probably don't know and we all take for granted. John Gerald's the, uh, you know, our, our, uh, the, one of the directors at our uh, historical society. Thank you for all that you do keeping, you know, Aurora's history, you know, because so many of us, you know, as, as, you know, we deal with our day to day, you know, if we, we see old things, we tend to throw it out and move on to the next thing. But our history is important to our community. It makes us what we are. And as long as we remember, as long as we know where we've come from, we always know where we're going. As long as we know our history, we'll always know who we are, you know, as a people. And thank you for that, sir. I really appreciate it. And, and Dennis Beck, you know, man, from, from slavery to glory, brother, the author, this is great. Now I'm looking at you gentlemen on here and, and, and clearly you are not African-American, you know? So. <laughs> I, I was get, I was actually going to point out, it is not lost on us. <laughs> it is fact, not lost on us. Yeah, but the fact that you gentlemen are, you know, have, have put this information together and have done this research, you know, to preserve this history that's so important to not just the African-American community, because it's important to the African-American community, but not just us, to the, to the, to the history of the city of Aurora, thank you for doing what you did. And, and you said something, and I, I'd like to close with, with this. Um, you said something this. you said that, you know, um, when that original book was written, you know, you wrote your, 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 there was slavery to glory. That was a part, that was a part of a, you know, a song or a part of another book. It was, it was a part of a, a letter to the editor, basically. To a le the a letter. And you said that maybe based on that, they spoke a little bit too soon about the glory and, you know, and put it in perspective, if you're talking about being owned and chattel and beat and, and just just disregarded as not subhuman one day you're born that way but then you got this freedom and you're able to live in your house and earn a living and take care of a family and get married and have a job and maybe one day you know run for office or, or just be a, a citizen of your community that is absolutely glory now you know there's a, a words to a song you know we shall overcome one day. I, I'm sure you guys have both heard, you know, heard that. The reality is we have already overcome. We have. And it's just a matter of taking advantage of the opportunities that have pre been presented to us. If those folks back then who were born slaves could come out of that and then make lives for themselves and, you know, build houses and build a, and build a part of a foundation of a community, there is no reason 
There's no excuse why we today have can recognize that we have overcome and we just have to take advantage of what's presented to us here in the city of Aurora and this whole country. You know, gentlemen, thank you very much for everything you do. You have made me think about a whole lot of things, you know, provoke some thought. Now, I'm sure some, you know, provoke some thought of some of our listeners. And, uh, man, you know, let's not wait till, you know, next uh, February to have these conversations again, man. Let's let, let's have them all the time, brother. You know, uh, we, we need to talk about the history, the history of all of Aurora, you know, so we can, like I said, as long as we know where we're from, we know where we're going. You guys have a good night. You Thank know, you, we'll Mr. Talk Mayor, again. thank you very much. Bye now. Take it easy, Clayton. Thank you. Thanks, man.